Well, it's 3 o'clock, and uh, I'm going to go ahead and get started here. And for those of you that picked up the program, there's a uh, pretty good bio in there of our, uh, of our seminar speaker, so I'm not going to read it to you. Other than, I will say that I've known Jeff for quite a few, well, several years now, and he's a real good guy. Uh, and the Mob Museum has helped us <coughs> immensely as a museum of gaming history. And uh, Jeff is extremely knowledgeable. Uh, he did a raffle one time, and I won the, uh, the liquor from, the, uh, <laughs> from down in the basement, which was really cool. But uh, anyway, Jeff Schumacher. Something I'm really back and sit down. Standing is not my favorite place. <laughs> uh, thank you all very much for coming. Appreciate it. Uh, I uh, want to thank the Casino Collectibles Association and the, the Museum of Gaming History. Uh, we've got a great relationship for, I don't know, six years now at least, maybe yep. seven years, something like that. Uh, we have a number of objects in the museum from, uh, from collectors in your group, and we continue to work on that. We'll have some new things coming out uh, in a couple of months from the, from the group, whether we uh, you loan them to us, or you sell them to us, we uh, or donate them to us. Uh, we appreciate all of that, and uh, we you know it's just incredibly helpful to help tell us tell stories in the museum. Uh, I guess I'll start by just mentioning about the Mod Museum. If you haven't been there lately, uh, we're back in business. Uh, we have been uh, for a while. Uh, you know, of course, during during the, the early part of the pandemic. Uh, we were shut down. Uh, we were closed for about 11 weeks. And you know, of course, there are museums around the country that were closed for a year or more. Uh, that's not the case with us. We were closed for 11 weeks. And then after that, of course, we had, you know, if you live here, you know, if you live elsewhere, you know, there are you know, some restrictions on, on distancing and, and the number of people we could have in the building. And so we, looked, we kind of, you know, just kind of moved along slowly for a few months. Uh, late last year, when we had kind of a spike, we, we went down again. I'll tell you though, 2021 has been an amazing year for us. You know, clearly there's a, a pent up demand, and all you have to do is walk through the South Point to see it. Uh, there is a, a tremendous demand to travel, to get out, do something different, uh, and Las Vegas is a great beneficiary of that, and so is the Mod Museum. I mean, we our numbers for, for May, uh, exceeded our, I'm talking about attendance numbers, they exceeded 2019, which was an incredible year for us. Uh, that was our record year. We had 410,000 people through the museum in 2019. And then the first two months of 2020, we were setting new record, you know, records for us for January and February, then of course, boom. But uh, now, uh, you know, around March, April, May now, we are seeing uh, everything come back to normal. And, and so we, as an organization, have this tremendous appetite to do more exhibits, to do more programs, to do this, to do that. And uh, so we are, uh, we're embarking on all of those things. And one of the, one of the biggest is in, uh, uh, one of the early ones that's big, is in August, we are going to uh, debut our new Flamingo Hotel exhibit. So it's gonna be really about the origins of the Flamingo. And uh, you know, we're, where there's a, you know, the percep the public story is, you know, public perception is, well, Bunch of Siegel invented Las Vegas, right? Uh, we are going to be, as we already do in the museum, but in a bigger scale, we are going to be setting the record straight on that. And we will be featuring some artifacts in this exhibit that are, are very rare and interesting. Uh, you know, for example, uh, we have the, the down payment check, the actual check that Willie Wilkerson wrote to for the down payment for the property that became the Flamingo Hotel. So he paid, you know, something like eighty six hundred dollars in a down payment for this thirty three acres that he bought in nineteen forty five. Uh, we also have uh, the, the the what they call cage checks, which you guys some of you would be familiar with. He he was a, a, a compulsive gambler in Las Vegas at that time and he spent a lot of money at different casinos on downtown on Fremont Street as well as on the burgeoning Las Vegas Strip, and uh, he had to pay his debts, right? So he'd write a check to the cage. So we have, you know, multiple thousand dollar checks that he wrote to the El Rancho Vegas, to the Last Frontier, uh, to the SS Rex downtown, to the Monte Carlo, 
Uh, and, and what it does is it really shows just how much of a problem he had uh, with his camera. And, uh, and it sort of leads to this point that he was sort of, you know, the, the project was stalling, he needed an infusion of money, he turns to the mob, you know, Meyer Lansky, Bugsy Siegel, Frank Costello, et cetera, uh, to, to, to really supply money for the Flamingo. And, and in comes Bugsy Siegel to take, you know, keep an eye on things, and then, you know, pretty soon it's Bugsy Siegel's Flamingo, and Bugsy Siegel's opening it and doing all the things that he does. So um, we have that. And then we have probably the other you know, really uh, great artifact that will be in this exhibit is a legal document signed by Benjamin Siegel uh, that's called a release of all demands. And it's a, it's a legal document that basically removes Will, uh, Billy Wilkerson, uh, the man who you know, started the Flamingo, that removes him entirely from the operation. And uh, it says that he has no obligations to the Flamingo, and the Flamingo has no obligations to him. And you know, this all was preceded by a threat you know, Bugs is like, <laughs> sign this or else. So uh, anyway, uh, we have that document. So these are going to be the featured artifacts in this exhibit. So I'm very excited about, uh, about that coming forward in, in August. Uh, but of course, here I'm here to talk about Howard Hughes. And so we're going to talk about Howard Hughes now. Uh, and I'll give you just a little bit of background on me. I, uh, I started my career as a journalist. I, I worked in journalism for 30 years. I thought that was going to be, you know, who I was and would be until my final day. Um, as everybody is familiar with, you know, the newspaper business, kind of uh, much like Billy Wilkerson's uh, bank account, <laughs> it just kind of grew. And, um, and I saw the writing on the wall and had the great fortune of being able to come and get this job at the Mob Museum seven and a half years ago and was able to change careers. I would not have been able to do that, though, if I had not, earlier in my journalism career, kind of discovered a great interest in history. And, you know, journalism is about what happened today that we're going to put in tomorrow's paper, right? Well, nowadays, it's like, what happened five minutes ago, we're going to put it on Twitter, because I haven't really been part of that, thank goodness. But, uh, you know, our, my mindset was, you know, we cover the news today, and it goes in the paper tomorrow morning. Well, I started, as a journalist, starting to take an interest in what happened 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40, 50, 60, 100 years ago, especially in Las Vegas, and, and discovered that I was more interested in that than I was in what was happening today. And started writing things about history. And ultimately concluded in uh, about 2003 that what I ought to do is write a book about this recent history of Las Vegas. I felt that there was an opportunity there that nobody had, that very few people had really taken advantage of yet. So, having sort of had a front row seat as a journalist for this 90s boom. If you were here, you know about the Mirage and Excalibur and the <coughs> and the Luxor and all of these casinos and mega resorts that opened uh, during that time and all of the growth out to the, up to the foothills of the valley. I thought, you know, why don't I be the first person to record that in the book? So ultimately did that with a book called Sun, Sin, and Suburbia, which came out in 2004. There was a chapter in that book about Howard Hughes, because if you're going to write about Las Vegas in this time, you have to talk about Howard Hughes. So I did a whole chapter. Uh, one of the people I, I spoke to for that chapter was Bob Stoldahl, who worked at uh, Channel 8, uh, the CBS affiliate here at the time, and who, uh, when Howard Hughes owned it. We'll come back to that. But uh, Bob had some interesting stories about, about uh, Howard Hughes and his involvement with the, with the TV station. So, Finish the book, come, book comes out, and I'm like, okay, I kind of got the bug now, I'm gonna write a lot of books. And what am I gonna write about next? Well, when I did the Howard Hughes chapter, I realized I had more than enough information for, for not just a chapter, but for an entire book. And to have a book that would focus on Howard Hughes's relationship with Las Vegas, his impact on Las Vegas, his legacy in Las Vegas. So I uh, was able to to get a second contract to write a book. I wrote a book about Howard Hughes that came out in 2008. Uh, it was not as creatively titled, it was called Howard Hughes. Uh, <laughs> but the, uh, it sold well with that title. People kind of look for Howard Hughes, there it is. 
But uh, anyway, so uh, both of those books now I have updated. Since up, I've had the good fortune of updating and expanding. So uh, a re updated and expanded version of the Simpson and Suburbia book came out in 2015. Uh, an updated and expanded book, the Howard Hughes book came out in 2020. So uh, yeah, so those are the two books. Now for, diff for a variety of reasons, there hasn't been a third book yet, but we're working on that. Uh, so Howard Hughes became an obsession with me, and I had the great fortune when working on the first edition of the book to have developed three sources that I thought were, it turned out, were, were really, really valuable to me in putting together in a book that would be different from previous biographies, previous books about Howard Hughes. And those three sources were Bob Mayhew. Bob Mayhew was still alive at that time. and. Uh, Bob had been, some of you may know, Bob Mayhew was Howard Hughes' right-hand man during the years that he was in Las Vegas in the 1960s. And Mayhew himself has wrote a book, and only Howard Hughes is just part of that book because he had a fascinating life himself. He was an FBI agent in, during World War II, and he became uh, uh, basically a spy for the United States during World War II. Uh, later, in the 50s, he became what was known uh, at the time, and some of you who read these kind of books would know, he was a cutout man. And a cutout man is someone who uh, does, does work for the CIA, but he's not in the CIA. So he does the kind of things the CIA doesn't want to be attributed back to them. So he was a cutout man for the CIA. And he did all kinds of those kind of guessing. We had Bob here as a banquet speaker several years ago. I'm going to say it was the most interesting presentation that we had. That must have been, yeah, about 2007 or so, 2008 is the latest. He, he died only a, a few months after, after my book came out. But yeah, Mayhew, fascinating guy. So he, I sat down, this is an interesting little tidbit, I sat down with him for about, uh, well, more than this amount of time. But I had 14 hours of recorded interviews with Bob. Uh, and I, of course, transcribed a lot of those, and I used quotes from those in the book. But now I just had this, I should have thought of this a long time ago, but I have this brainstorm that what I need to do, these are those little micro cassettes. You know how you record things on micro cassettes? I'm going to digitize those so I can listen to them again. And then uh, I think what I can do is I can, uh, what I'll do is I'll edit them and create excerpts and put those out on the internet where people can listen to them. But uh, Bob told, and I also have to listen to him again because there may be stuff in there that's new, that makes more sense to me today than it did when I was just a youngster, you know, at the time. So uh, anyway, Bob was a great resource for me. Uh, another great resource was uh, Gordy Margulis, and Gordon Margulis was a uh, one of you know you hear this phrase about related to Howard Hughes that he was surrounded by the Mormon, Mormon mafia, right? There's, there's an ounce of truth to that phrase, but the, the real story was that there were Mormons involved in his small group of aides who took care of him, but there also were non-Mormons in that group. And one of those was Gordy Margulis. Gordy uh, was Catholic, so, you know. Uh, but uh, Gordy was the cook for Howard Hughes. He also did other jobs. For example, appearing, he ended up appearing on the cover of Time Magazine. Now, if you can picture this cover, if we had a PowerPoint, I would show it to you, but when Howard Hughes came uh, to Las Vegas, and then when he left Las Vegas, he went up the fire escape of the Desert Inn. And, and I forget if it was going up or coming down, he was carried by someone. And this person literally carried him up the stairs, or carried him down the stairs. I'm forgetting which. And it was Gordy Margulis. He, did he was a real muscular guy, and he was able to carry this you know, very frail old, old guy. So uh, Gordy uh, had a lot of firsthand information about it's really about not about like our Hughes' business affairs and his you know all his investments and so forth it was more about like what kind of guy was he? you know what kind of things did he do day to day uh, and what were his problems medical problems and so forth so Gordy Margulis was a tremendous resource for me he died only like a year after uh, the book came out and then the third person who was just a tre tremendous resource for me was a guy named Paul Wynn W-I-N-N, and Paul Wynn was a, I, I have a whole chapter on Paul in my book, and it's called Secretary to Hughes, that's the title, because uh, Paul Wynn really served as a, 
a, um, I don't know, you might call him an assistant, administrative assistant today. And he uh, did a lot of sort of paperwork for you, but he also interacted with him a lot and, and, and really understood, uh, you know, a lot about him, talked to him on the phone a lot, uh, dealt with, you know, brought him together with other people, those kinds of things that helped, you know, helped him do his work. Well, just for the record, Paul still lives, and he lives in Sun City, Summerlin, and I talk to him on a weekly basis, really. Uh, we've developed, I think, a very good relationship, because he still is this sort of final arbiter of fact when it comes to Howard Hughes. And there's so many rumors, so many myths, uh, so many legends about him, and I always, if I ever have a question, I, I gotta call Paul, because he, he knows. Um, or if he doesn't know, he, he'll, he'll know somebody who might be able to tell me. Although many, many people now are, are passing away from that era, so it's harder and harder to verify things that way. But anyway, these three sources for me were, were tremendously valuable in turning my book into something worth, worth reading. Um, the brief, uh, I'll give you a brief, uh, basically, background on Howard Hughes for those who aren't familiar or aren't that familiar with him. Uh, you know, and you probably know most of these things in, in, intuitively. Uh, he inherited a fortune from his father. Uh, his, his mother and father died, both died when Howard, Howard Jr. was very young. He was a teenager still. And, and Howard insisted on inheriting the family business, which was Hughes Tool Company, which made these rotating bits for mining that were tremendously successful. And they, they really were a game changer for oil drilling because it made it much easier to do. Uh, just the whole nature of these these turning bits uh, as opposed to just sort of just beating the ground to death like they were doing before. Uh, instead, you're grinding it up and, and it just made a lot more sense. And his dad basically invented this uh, drill bit. And, and so uh, Howard inher ultimately inherited the company and when he was 19 years old. And the his family members thought this was nuts. Like, how could he possibly allow a 19 year old to, to inherit this big company and run it? And, and they went to court over this. And they wanted, you know, they wanted little Howard to go back to college and, you know, and uh, learn a few things. And then maybe he can work his way up you know, through the business, you know, the sweet floor, you know the story. And um, instead, Howard's like, no, I, I'm gonna take it over now. And, and he did. And he took it over and he hired, he wisely hired smart people to work around him to help him build this business. And, and because he wasn't really into, he had no interest in mining whatsoever. Howard didn't care about mining at all. He liked the money he came from. But he, so he hired the right people to run the, the mining business because what did he want to do? He wanted to make movies. So, you know, in the 1920s, uh, you know, Hollywood was uh, big, that was, a, that was like the boom for Hollywood, the 20s and then the 30s. Uh, and, you know, people were going to the theater like crazy. And, and it was even silent films, keep in mind. People were just flocking to the theaters. This is amazing technology. We have to go and see these movies, even though they were like, you go back and watch them. Some were wonderful, right? Some were just horrifically bad. And, you know, I guess there's bad movies now, too. But I mean, you know, it's all relative. But so Howard wanted to make movies. So he, he moves uh, to, to, to Los Angeles and starts a movie company called Cato Productions, C-A-B-D-O and starts making movies. And the first movie he makes is, is, is terrible. Uh, the second movie he makes is better. The third movie he makes is a movie called The Racket. And some people, it came out in 1928, some people claim it's like the first ever gangster movie. Now, that's not quite fair because you can go back in movie history, I've had to do this, and you can find gangstery kind of movies going back to like 1906. But, it was, you might call it the first full-length gangster movie that got a lot of like people watching it that was well-respected, and it was called The Racket. And um, it, re it was remade, by the way, and you might have seen this one. 1950 or 51, Robert Mitchum made a movie called The Racket. If you ever see that on TCM, uh, T TCM or whatever, that, that's inspired by the Howard Hughes movie from 1928. Uh, and then Howard decided, well, we're going to make a big movie. It's time now. I've had my, you know, we've, we've been practicing now for a while. Now we're going to make a real movie. And so he, he uh, wants to direct uh, in himself, and he takes on a movie called Hell's Angels, which, you know, is a World War I uh, flying uh, adventure movie. 
and uh, he, put, he, it's, he he decides that the, you know if you go back and watch that movie, you'll see that like the dialogue is, is terrible, uh, some of the acting not good, uh, but what still stands out are all these flying stunts that were going on, these airplanes flying through the air, shooting at each other, absolutely astonishing. To this day, I don't think the best director could pull that off with real airplanes. I mean, it's really amazing. And, and Howard insisted on this. He wanted, there was cameras in one plane, and then there's two other planes flying around each other, you know, shooting at each other, and um, almost crashing, and all of these things. And um, he made a, a pretty astonishing picture. Uh, but even a far more memorable picture that he made after that was a movie called Scarface. And uh, this is the original Scarface. Uh, you know, it was ultimately remade with, in Miami with a Miami theme later in 1983, which you've all no doubt seen. And I understand they're making a new one now that's set in Los Angeles with uh, Hispanic characters. So, um, you know, it lives on. But that was, um, that Scarface, original Scarface, uh, Howard Hughes was the producer on that. And one thing he had to deal with a lot at that time was censorship. And, it was quite a violent movie, and if you watch it today, you know it's pretty tame by what we see today. But it, it, was, it was a lot of shooting going on, a lot of people dying, and and so he had to deal with censors not only at the sort of Hollywood level, but also at the state level, because every state had like a film commission to decide what their standards would be. So he might be able to show the movie in New Orleans, New Orleans, but he couldn't show it in Mississippi, or he couldn't show it in whatever. And because it was kind of set in Chicago and kind of based on the Al Capone story, they wouldn't show it in Chicago at all. And not until the 1940s did they finally allow that movie to be shown. And keep in mind, that's like 10, 12 years later in Chicago, they're like, okay, you can show the movie. And they did, and they had, it was sold out for weeks because everybody wanted to see it, um, even though it was quite old by then. Uh, so, interestingly though, after uh, Hughes makes like one or two more movies, he makes one called The Front Page, which is the original front page, uh, really great uh, movies, the three, three or four versions of that have been made, and uh, they're all good, really. Uh, the first one's very good. Uh, he was a producer on that. But he, then he loses interest in filmmaking, for whatever reason, because he becomes interested in flying, he, interested in, in airplanes. And so in the, in the early to mid, to late 30s, Howard Hughes is obsessed with airplanes. And what he uh, wants to do is create the fastest airplane in history. So he does. In 1936, he sets the air speed record. And uh, he, he is naturally acclaimed because he's, he flew it himself, of course. And he, he uh, goes across the US in record time. Then in 1938, he flies around the world in record time, shatters the, shatters the world record for flying around. Charles shatters the record for flying around the world in, in record time. Ticker tape parades in New York and in Houston, where he's from, and I believe Chicago. And uh, you know, there's pictures of him with uh, uh, Mayor LaGuardia, LaGuardia in uh, New York in an open vehicle going down the road. And, uh, and you know, it was all that, that ticker tape that they would throw out the windows or whatever. It's, it's they shouldn't do. But they thought it was a good idea at the time. And, um, and then, you know, so he's like one of the most famous people in the world. And this is before any of this other stuff that we all know about has happened. 1938, uh, Hughes is on top, really on top of the world. Um, he now invests in Transworld Air an Airline. He wants to own an airline. So he invests in what becomes known as Transworld Airlines, TWA. And uh, they beca it becomes the one of the biggest you know international airlines in the world. Um, and during World War II, he wants to get involved with uh, building planes for a war effort, right? And he, so he's building a what is called the XF-11, and it's a it's a reconnaissance plane. So he wants to fly over you know Europe. He wants to fly over the enemy lines and find out what's going, take pictures and find out what's going on. Uh, ultimately, that plane was not used uh, during World War II, but it was, uh, uh, it was really an amazing airplane. The other one he uh, most famously made was the flying boat, which he called uh, Hercules. It was H-4 Hercules. Uh, what was it called to the world? Spruce Goose. Spruce Goose, because journalists, some journalists, smart aleck, decided to call it the Spruce Goose, and it stuck. 
Uh, it was mostly made of birch wood, not spruce, but whatever. And uh, the Spruce Goose was this giant airplane. Now, why did they? Why did he want to make this huge airplane? Because early in the wars, as you know, U-boats were just causing all kinds of trouble. The German U-boats were, were menacing the waters of the Atlantic. And what we needed to do was fly over them, right? Let's fly all of our troops and all of our supplies in the air to Europe. Let's not try to go through this U-boat menace in the, in the water. Now, later we figured out how to deal with with the U-boats, but, and I'm not a World War II expert, but I mean, I know that's what, we figured that out at some point. Uh, we didn't need the flying boat anymore, as it was called, uh, it was known. Uh, but Hughes persisted in finishing this boat, so after his, his, his contract was over with the government, he started pouring his own money into it. People thought this was a folly, they didn't think this plane would ever fly. Um, he had it, you know, down in Los Angeles. He's working on this thing. He's putting his blood, sweat, and tears into it. And the thing about Howard Hughes was, he wasn't just sitting in a CEO's office saying, do this and do that. He's down there climbing all over the plane, trying to come up with the best way to build this thing so that he could do what they wanted to do. So many doubters. And to the point where the U members of the U.S. Senate, you know, accused him of, uh, you know, really wasting taxpayer money on this, on this, uh, airplane. He went and famously testified in 1947 before uh, Congress and, and really held his own, more than held his own. He really, uh, you know, was the star of the show and really made the case. No, he said, this plane will fly, and uh, if it doesn't fly, I will leave the United States. Period. That's what he said. And he, he made this vow, and, you know, basically on national television, that he was going to leave the U.S. if this thing didn't fly. Well, People didn't really necessarily feel like they had to hold him to that, but he held himself to it. And so he kept working on this, uh, this Hercules airplane and took it out for a test, you know, test in the, the water in Long Beach Harbor. Uh, in, and uh, they've got reporters out there with cameras. They have uh, reporters and other people on, on the plane. And he was, is just fluttering around in the water at first. And that's all anybody thought was going to happen. He's coming around, you, you can listen on YouTube, you can listen to this reporter talking live about what happens, and he says, hey, we're accelerating at a pretty rapid rate. You know, we're going 50, 60, 70 miles an hour, and suddenly the reporter's like, I think we're airbound. Air, I mean, air, yeah, we're in, we're in the air. And um, in fact, they were. And uh, they, the plane flew for about a minute. And um, that's all Howard Hughes needed to do, to say, this sucker will fly. <laughs> and uh, it was a pretty big deal for him, and a pretty big deal for a lot of people who had been such you know, with so many doubters and, and so forth. So, uh, the, unfortunately, the Hercules never flew again. Uh, it uh, was ultimately ended up in a, a giant. You know, if anybody visited, but mm -hmm. it was in this circular building in Long Beach where you could go and look at it. And then later, it was broken into pieces and. It was taken up by boat uh, up the uh, coast to uh, McMinnville, Oregon, where it currently is housed in, in the Evergreen Aviation Museum. And I had a chance to go look at it during the research for my book, and uh, it's big. <laughs> it's very, very, very big. Uh, and cool. You know, it's very, very awesome. It's awesome. And uh, it's still intact, and, and you can go see it up there. Now, Ever, uh, Evergreen Aviation Museum is, I don't know, about 30 miles outside of Portland. So if you ever have the chance, it's worth it. It's worth it. Um, so now I've, I've given you a lot of background uh, and leading up to Las Vegas, right? Because this is the, the area for me that I mean, I've gotten through like, you know, first third of my notes. But uh, quick note, we talked about the Flamingo earlier. Uh, Howard Hughes was an early investor in the Flamingo Hotel. A lot of people don't know that. Uh, what happened is Billy Wilkerson, the origin originator of the Flamingo, was looking for investors. He knew Howard, and uh, he asked him uh, for money, and Howard said, I'll give you $200,000 prepaid advertising contract. So he gave him the $200,000, but of course, what Billy Wilkerson had to do was provide $200,000 worth of advertising to Howard Hughes for his movies and other things in the Hollywood Reporter newspaper, which Billy Wilkerson owned. So it was a pretty good deal. It was essentially a, a gift, essentially. And uh, so he was an early investor in the Flamingo. And so I think later, a few years later, when he was started coming to Las Vegas a lot in the late 40s and early 50s, he always stayed at the Flamingo Hotel. 
and he always got good, you know, he has got good service there. And uh, uh, so that was an interesting early foray for Hughes in, La, in Las Vegas. Um, he was a frequent visitor to Las Vegas. He would spend, he wouldn't just come for a weekend, he would come for a couple of weeks, three weeks, four weeks. Uh, we'll deal with a little bit later with some of his medical and mental issues, but uh, he would come here to get out of the limelight. You know, in, in Los Angeles, he, he, he brought it on himself largely, but he, he dated Hollywood uh, starlets and, uh, you know, the biggest actresses. Any name uh, of an actress you can think of from that era, almost any of them, Howard Hughes dated them one time or another, or tried to. And uh, so he was, uh, he was uh, in the spotlight all the time. For that, he was in the spotlight for his business activities, and so he sometimes wanted a break. And so he would come to Las Vegas for that. And uh, he wasn't much of a gambler, but he liked the shows. He liked to come to the shows. Uh, he liked to, you know, bring friends here and other people and meet them and spend time with them. And so he inevitably uh, was at the Flamingo Hotel. That's where he would stay. And he would he would rent a couple of. In those days, you had these bungalow, you know, suites. Everything was a most glorified motels back then, right? And so he he basically had a suite motel room uh, and a couple of them. And uh, this, this man named Dick Odesky, I don't know if he was still around when any of you remember him, but he, uh, he was a publicity man in, in Las Vegas for many, many years, starting in the 40s. And in his memoir, he talks about when Howard Hughes came to the Flamingo, and he wanted all of the windows in these, uh, these bungalows that he rented uh, covered. And he didn't want any light to get in whatsoever. And, and so, Dick Odesky was in charge of figuring out how to, how to do this, and he, he just found these blankets. You know, the, the trademark color of the flamingo is red, so they had these red blankets. And he takes these red blankets and they, they cover up, they tape them up, they cover up all these windows with these blankets. And, and uh, he was just happy. At the end of his stay, he says to Dick Odesky, okay, I want you to take down all these blankets, you know, package them up, and take them with me. He liked him so well, he wanted to go to him somewhere else and do it. Uh, which he did. Uh, Howard Hughes, always, always something. Uh, he was actually moved to Las Vegas in 1953-54. Uh, he, he moved into a, a little house uh, called what became known in the inside the company as the Greenhouse, because it was painted green. Uh, but this house still stands today. It's on the site of Channel 8, over uh, off Channel, Channel 8 Drive, just off the strip. Behind the Channel 8 Studios is this house, and they still use it. Uh, Channel 8 still uses it. They have office space in there, and it's still kept up the way it's mid-century modern style house. Not that big, uh, but he was, that was his residence for about a year. Now, what people, what Paul Wynn, my, my fact checker, will tell you is that he didn't, he doesn't believe he, that he was ever slept in the house. He would go over there and work, but then he would inevitably go back to the Flamingo with the covered you know, windows <laughs> or what have you, and he would sleep there. Uh, but that he spent a lot of time in this house doing work, calling people and whatnot. And, uh, and then uh, when he was left Las Vegas in 1954 to go back to Los Angeles, he ordered his staff to uh, completely uh, what would be the word? Tie up the house, right? That would be the way. So what he did is he wanted all the windows to be insulated from the outdoor, so, so no dust would get in, that kind of thing. He wanted everything shut down and locked up. And why was he so concerned about that? Well, atomic testing. He was paranoid about atomic testing, and, and he was really one of the early people who were concerned about radiation and so forth. So we'll come back to that. But he. Uh, he wanted. He didn't want anything getting inside this house while he was gone. So the thing is, he never returned to the house. The house remained that way until he died in 1976. And after 1976, they were looking for a will. We'll get back to that. And he didn't sign. He didn't have a signed will. And they're like, "Where's Howard Hughes' will? Oh, maybe it's in the greenhouse." So Paul Wynn, who I mentioned earlier, was one of the men who was sent to Las Vegas to go and opened up this house and see if there was a will in there. No will. But there were newspapers on the table from like 1954. There were uh, old uh, movies uh, that he was reviewing. Remember, he owned RKO Pictures at this time, so he was doing all kinds of movie stuff. 
little stuff like that. And, and uh, it, it's just an amazing story, really. And then and later, you know, uh, he owned that property. He continued to own it even after that. And, uh, and it's still, the house is still there. So he just had a familiarity with Las Vegas. Uh, and then he, he didn't spend a lot of time here until he moved here again in 1966. And this is the, the more famous move to Las Vegas. Uh, he, uh, Bob Mayhew now is his right-hand man, his fixer, his man to make things happen. And he says he's living in Boston, Hughes, at this time. Never been completely clear on why he was living in Boston. There was speculation at the time that he had gone there for medical treatment, but that never happened, so it's not clear. I mean, Boston would be a great place for that time, especially that was the place to go. <coughs> but I don't think that he got any medical treatment there. But he was there a brief time, and then he decided, I want to move to Las Vegas secretly, and he didn't want to fly, which is a, a, the all-time great pilot, right? But what it was, he probably didn't trust anybody else to fly him. So he decided he wants to come by train. So uh, Bob Mayhew, and he wants to do it secretly. He doesn't want anybody to know what he's doing. And so he wants his own train. Now, if you think about, especially then, but even now, you think about trains have schedules, and they all have to come along these routes on schedules, and you have to change, change to all these different tracks, right? Um, you work for that. But they, they have to go on all these, so what Bob Mayhew had to do was he had to contact all these train companies along the way and coordinate a time for Howard Hughes' train to come secretly from Boston to Las Vegas uh, without anybody knowing. And so that's, that's what he did. I mean, Mayhew was a guy who knew how to do those kind of things. He contacted the CEOs of these, you know, you call somebody in mid man in middle management, they're gonna go, oh, come on, we can't do that. But he had to call the CEO and make it work, and, and so they did. Howard Hughes was dropped off. Uh, they stopped the train out near, uh, what if you know Las Vegas, out in North Las Vegas, uh, near Cary Avenue. And there was a crossing there at Cary Avenue at that time. And, uh, and they stopped the train there. He's brought off the train and put into a van, and he's on a stretcher. And he's put on a van, into a van, and they drive to the Desert Inn Hotel. And they come up the fire escape, uh, and so nobody knows. And he ends up on the ninth floor, that's the top floor of the Desert Inn Hotel. They've rented out the entire floor. And uh, these are the high roller suites at the Desert Inn, and he has rented all of them. And uh, he moves into one of those suites, not the best one, and um, he basically is, lives in that suite for the next four years. Now, there are some people who would argue, uh, there's been books about this, articles, speculation that, you know, we did all kinds of things where he left the Desert Inn during that time. I am one who does not believe that he did leave. I believe that he was there the whole time. And uh, all of his <coughs> affairs and all of his other affairs were conducted either by phone or memo. Uh, and uh, he stayed in that area. By then he had tons of medical and mental issues that he was dealing with. And uh, he was not really ready to go gallivanting off to a brothel in central Nevada or whatever people thought he was doing. Um, that's my opinion. Um, so what is, what is Hughes' plan to do in Las Vegas? Why was he here in the first place? Well, uh, Transworld Airlines. Remember, he was an owner of Transworld Airlines, and he didn't act, it was a corporation, but he didn't act like it was a corporation. He acted like it was his company. So he was going to decide everything. Um, and the board didn't like that. The shareholders didn't like a lot of his decisions. So there was a conflict within that company between Howard and everybody, basically. And he owned the majority of the shares, so he could make decisions. Well, um, conflicts ensued to the point where lawsuits were filed, and attempts were made to, uh, to remove Hughes from power at TWA. This went on for years, in the 1950s and early 60s, and Hughes was very stubbornly, uh, did not act, uh, did not do anything differently. Well, ultimately, it looked like in the courts, it was possible that Hughes was gonna lose, that he was gonna lose uh, what he had. However, just so coincidentally, the stock price of TWA in 1965 was at its highest point ever. And so Hughes, not being a dumb person, sold all of his shares at the peak, and he received a check for $564.5 million uh, from TWA. And it was probably the largest 
check, ever, it was said to be the largest single check ever written at that point in time. I'm sure we've eclipsed it many times over since, but it, in 1965, that was a, a lot of money. Well, there was also a lot of money that the IRS would be uh, taking its fair share. If you know about anything about tax history, you know that, that you know, there's stories in the paper lately about a lot of these billionaires aren't paying any, any tax whatsoever. They couldn't get away with that in 1965. The, 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 all these loopholes didn't exist. So you could pay as much as 50, 60, 70 percent on something in that kind of a proceed. And Hughes did not want uh, to pay that money. The way to get around that was to turn around and invest it right away, right? So Hughes moves to, to Las Vegas on the premise that he is going to invest his money here. He's going to invest his money throughout Nevada. And that's what he did. He started buying real estate. He bought mining claims. Uh, he bought an airport. Um, he bought a golf course. I mean, all these things that he was doing in an effort to sort of spend his money, which is good for Nevada, good for Las Vegas. Everybody's happy with Howard Hughes. One person wasn't happy with Howard Hughes, and that was Mo Dalitz. Mo Dalitz was the, the Cleveland mob guy who ran the Desert Inn Hotel and the Stardust at that time. And Mo was very concerned about this fellow taking up all of his high roller suites uh, on the ninth floor. He wanted Howard Hughes out because the high rollers couldn't come in and spend all the money over the New Year's. Because Howard came here on Thanksgiving of 1966. And so by mid-December, Mo's like, hey, when are you leaving? You know? uh, there had been some conversation within the Hughes Corporation about uh, buying a house uh, in Las Vegas. He, he actually bought three houses here one of which became, is now Spring Mountain Ranch State Park, uh, and uh, one was downtown, uh, and um, I forget the home. But he bought a bunch of houses, and the idea was that he would move into one of them with his estranged wife, Jean Peters. That was the idea. What he really wanted to do was move Jean into the house, and then he would stay at the Desert Inn. That was always his plan. And Jean figured that out. She's like, no, she didn't really like Las Vegas. Too hot and dry for her. But so, uh, so he just doesn't want to move. So he's at the DI, there's a stalemate. And ultimately, Mo Dalitz is like, okay, uh, I'm going to call the sheriff, and the, shower, the sheriff is going to physically evict you from the Desert Inn. Who was the sheriff at that time? Ralph Lamb. Ralph Lamb. Sheriff Ralph Lamb. Tough. Tough sheriff. And, and Ralph's going to, by God, he's going to go up there and do this. Well, this was panic time. So Bob Mayhew calls. Guy named Johnny Roselli. And if you know in mob history, Johnny Roselli was a mob guy who was affiliated with Los Angeles, with Chicago. He was based in Las Vegas. He was a deal maker extraordinaire. Um, and he uh, figured out how to deal with this. He called Jimmy Hoffa. Jimmy Hoffa <laughs> called Mo Dalitz and said, Jimmy Hoffa, the teacher's union, he calls Mo Dalitz and says, You cannot evict Howard Hughes from the Desert Inn. Come on, let's come up with a better solution. And Mo listens to, to Jimmy Hoffa, and uh, they don't do that. Instead, Bob Mayhew and Roselli and these guys come up with an idea. Let's buy the Desert Inn so that Howard can stay. And, and so that's ultimately what they did. In March of 1967, Hughes buys the Desert Inn Hotel. Hughes is looking at the books. Now that he has this hotel, he's like, to Bob Mayhew, he's like, man, this looks like we made a pretty good investment. Why don't we see if we can buy some more casinos? And the, so there's this storyline that you'll, you'll hear in some articles and books that, that, Hughes, uh, that, that uh, Hughes had all along planned to buy casinos in Las Vegas. I did not believe that's the case. I believe that he didn't really figure this out until he got here, that this was something that would be worth doing. And um, so he buys, proceeds to buy a bunch of hotels, right? He buys the Sands, he buys the Frontier, he buys the Silver Slipper. He buys the Castaways. Later, he buys the Landmark. Um, he buys, bu uh, buys Harold's Club in Reno. And just a little bit ago, I, I got a Harold's Club chip from him. <laughs> so I'm very pleased with that. Um, nobody talks about his Harold's Club purchase. Um, the one thing Paul Wynn uh, Paul Wynn remembers about the, the Harold's Club purchase is that it came with a gun club. Uh, because when you bought the hotel, there was a gun club, I think, in Lake Tahoe, right? Yeah, and they had their own casino there, too. And they had their own casino there. So he actually got two for one there. But when Hughes died, the Hughes organization had no idea what to do with this gun club. So they, they didn't uh, keep it for a while. But uh, uh, yeah, so he buys. So he also wanted to buy another casino. 
and that was the Stardust. And he, he tried very hard to buy the Stardust. He had a deal to buy the Stardust from Odalis, uh and the Chicago outfit as well. Uh, but the federal government was getting concerned about his uh, monopolistic tendencies. This was a time when uh, there was apparently more concern about that than there is today. Uh, and um, and uh, so he really was prevented by the Justice Department from buying the startup because they felt like he was going to gain a monopoly on the Strip. Now, if you think about the Las Vegas Strip today, I mean, there's multiple owners, right? But in the end, there's like two, right? There's MGM and there's, there's Caesars, and, and they own like two-thirds of the casino. They don't own this one right now, but they own, they own another one. And uh, so today, you don't hear anybody talking about monopolies, at least not the government, uh, when it comes to uh, casinos. But at the time, they were very concerned. Now, what's interesting about that to me is if Hughes buys the Stardust in 1968 or 69, what movie never gets made? Casino. Casino. <laughs> I mean, because yeah. what ends up happening is the, uh, Ar the Chicago mob orchestrates this purchase, and Argent Corporation is created, and uh, Lefty Rosenthal is brought in to run the casino, the Robert De Niro character, and uh, you know that whole movie ensues. And it would not probably have happened if Howard Hughes had gone. So, interesting little sideline. Um, Can I ask yes. how many shell companies did Howard Hughes have? Because they also had like the Sumo Corporation. So I, I skipped something almost on purpose, sort of on purpose. One of the things that Howard Hughes did in the early 50s was he acquired this large plot of land on the west side of Las Vegas, way out at the time, way out on the west side of Las Vegas, 25,000 acres. And the way he did that is he did it as a land swap. He bought a bunch of land in northern Nevada along the railroad tracks. You know how railroad track land is like all these pieces and parts? And he ultimately bought those pieces along the railroad in northern Nevada. He traded those basically to the US government in exchange for the land west of Las Vegas, which he bought for uh, like two or three dollars an acre or something like that. And his goal at the time was he wanted to move Hughes aircraft or port parts of Hughes aircraft to Las Vegas and Hughes Aircraft Company. But the people who ran his aircraft for him thought this was a horrible idea. First of all, they weren't, they didn't think most of their really brilliant engineers they had in LA would be willing to relocate to Las Vegas, which is still at the time was very, very small. We're talking 1952 or 53. Um, you know, this would have been a very strange thing. We didn't have a university here at that time. Uh, how are you gonna have these engineers flowing up through this company to create the greatest you know, technology that the government needs to win the Cold War from Las Vegas. So Hughes was a little bit off, I think, on this, but he had this idea that that's why he got that land. Well, they never built one, right? The Hughes aircraft, it wasn't relocated. And um, nothing ever, he didn't sell it either, but he had this land until he died. And ultimately, uh, his executor, Will Lummis, who was his cousin, uh, saw an opportunity. Let's sell off the casinos, Let's sell off a lot of this other property. Let's sell off the airplanes. Let's sell off the TV station and all this stuff. We'll make a lot of money on all these sales, which they did. But let's hold on to this 25,000 acres west of Las Vegas because we're going to turn that into what became Summerlin, which, you know, it's huge, right? I mean, it, there's a more there's 120,000 people, I think, living there now. And it's not done yet. And, uh, you know, it's just astonishing what they turned it into. What's funny to me about that is Howard Hughes himself, I don't think, ever would have said, let's build neighborhoods, let's build <laughs> churches and schools and parks. Yeah. It would not have crossed his mind to do that. But, you know, the wiser heads prevailed and they, they helped to grow Las Vegas into what it is today. But, uh, yeah, so to answer your question, uh, Suma Corp I, I didn't really answer your question. Suma Corporation it was the renamed Howard Hughes Corporation in the early <coughs> 70s. So this is even before Hughes died. So Suma existed about 1973. It was the brainchild of a guy named Bill Gay, who we'll come back to in a minute. And Bill Gay was an executive within Hughes' organization uh, who uh, almost did it on his own. Hughes was living in London at the time and was kind of out of touch by then in a lot of ways. 
And so when Hughes started seeing these documents that he had to sign that said Summa Corporation, look, what, what the heck is Summa Corporation? It kind of happened without him knowing. Uh, in the end, that was the, that's the over, that was the overarching company. And I don't think Shell Companies is really the way he operated. Uh, I'm not sure, if, I understand Shell Companies. I mean, it, Summa had real employees and real things it was doing. Uh, you know, you had Hughes, Hughes Tool Company based in Houston, you had Hughes Aircraft in Los Angeles, um, and you had Summa Corporation, which owned the casinos and some of the other things that they had going. Yes, sir. Yeah, Hughes Aircraft, <clears throat> when he spun it off from Hughes Tool to die, yeah. he donated it basically to where all the profits went to the Medical Corporation in Delaware. Yes. Okay. So that was a tax ploy, too. Yes. <laughs> yes. He didn't like paying taxes. Right. And that wasn't part of Summa Corporation. No, you're right. You're right about that. Wasn't there another one that used operations? There were other smaller companies. There was the helicopter division, which was a separate unit. Yeah. Uh, and there was a, uh, like a technology company that Bill Gay created. I forget the name of that. Uh, that Hughes also didn't know much about. Uh, uh, there was the mining. There was a company involved with the mining, uh, the mining claims. Uh, so he often would create companies that were all wholly owned by him, but they were all, they were, yeah, he did that. Um, yeah, I, I don't have my notes in front of me to explain the whole thing with the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. I could do a whole separate thing on that, but um, you know, it's a really interesting story in itself. It's well, in yeah. my book. <laughs> <laughs> um, you might know a lot. Well, I've worked for Hughes Aircraft. Yeah. Did so you work so in so LA? So we, were, LA? we were well aware of the medical corporation yeah. and how it operated. And when you're dealing with government contracts, how overhead pricing was, was done and all that, uh -huh. it, it became a big chore. I got it. Now, the thing that, that Howard Hughes Medical Institute was created by Howard Hughes in the early, early 50s. In fact, he signed the documents creating it in the greenhouse in Las Vegas. Uh, or he created the draft, excuse me, of it, and he signed it there. It was never intended, uh, and it, I don't think Howard Hughes was a great philanthropist. Uh, he talked a good game, he wasn't really much of a philanthropist, um, but, but when they ultimately sold Hughes Aircraft and uh, the, then this endowment was created for the Medical Institute, it has become this gigantic medical research operation that it is today. It's involved in, it's, it's, it's researchers, it's physicians are involved in, you know, coronavirus vaccines and like every imaginable thing. Uh, out there that's helping people live longer and better and all that stuff. And so the legacy is there. It's just almost by accident or it happened after he died, you know. Uh, but, you know, you've got to give him some credit, I guess. Well, his name's on it. Uh, I'm running out of time, I see. Uh, but I want to just point out that at the, in 1970, uh, Hughes left Las Vegas. So. And he left, again, mysteriously. At first, people didn't know why he was leaving. Uh, it had to do with in palace intrigue inside the operations. Bill uh, Gay and uh, an attorney named Chester Davis uh, basically, I believe, conspired to remove Bob Mayhew from the operation. And, and Bob Mayhew, they felt, was stealing from the company. What they, what I believe was really happening was that they didn't like his high profile and they didn't like that he was going to be given like all this additional power by Hughes. And so they started poisoning Mayhew's name with Hughes. And ultimately Hughes uh, uh, fires Mayhew and then he gets on a plane at Nellis Air Force Base and takes off. And he moves to the Bahamas, uh, then he moves to Nicaragua, then he moves here to Vancouver, then he moves back to Nicaragua, then he, I don't think I have this right, then he moves to the Bahamas, then he moves to London, uh, and then he moves back to, uh, Bahamas then Acapulco. Ultimately in Acapulco is when he is uh, dying, uh, 1976. Uh, neglect, I believe, on the part of uh, many people involved in this organization. They get him on a plane. They want him to, to get medical care in uh, Houston, Texas, uh, where, you know, and they want him to die in America, which that doesn't complicate things quite as much. So he ends up dying on the airplane. Uh, as far as I can tell from my research, he died in Mexico, but if you're in the plane, they said he died right before they landed, you know, whatever. Uh, so he died in the United States. Uh, and then uh, the, the, the whole 
world blows up. Like, where's the Howard Hughes will? He doesn't have a will. Uh, suddenly, a thing called the Mormon will appears. And uh, there's a guy named Melvin Dumar. I can come back and talk to you about that another time. Melvin Dumar claims that he this will was delivered to him at a gas station in Utah. And uh, <laughs> he, he, takes this gap, he takes this will to the to the Salt Lake City headquarters of the Mormon Church. The church, standing to benefit from the will, as is Melvin Dumar in the writing of it, takes it to the court in Las Vegas. Las Vegas, in, inexplicably in my mind today, looking back, takes this will seriously enough that they hold a trial to determine its validity. Handwriting experts are brought in on both sides. Everybody wants this will to be real except for, you know, people who live in reality. <laughs> <laughs> and ultimately it's determined the jury says, no, this is not a legitimate will, it's a fake will. Uh, and uh, instead, the estate is broken up uh, into, with his, uh, his family, and most of whom he had never met <laughs> or knew. There were 22 heirs who originally got, uh, were, were inherited uh, his riches, and I mentioned Will Lummis, he was the executive of the will, he was a cousin who had met, he was one time when he was a kid, and, uh, but Will Lummis, who looked remarkably like Howard Hughes and spoke like him, um, was tall, thin at the time. And uh, anyway, he did a brilliant job. He sold off his casinos uh, to different people. You know, the Mirage is built on the site of one of them. You know, all kinds of those, those stories. And, um, and then he built Summerlin, and uh, we know about that. But uh, so questions. Are there any other questions about how to use? Good yes, question, Winfrey. Uh, there's the legend of the reason that Hughes bought the Silver Slipper because he thought that there was a camera inside the Slipper. Is that true or just hearsay? So the most the most uh, uh, prominent story you hear is he didn't like the light from yeah. the uh, from the shoe rotating shoe <laughs> slipper, but that's just not true. Uh, his his windows were blacked out just like they had done back in the 40s at the Flamingo. He had blacked out the window. Now, what was happening with casino purchases had entirely to do with what Bob Mayhew could come up with. Basically, the directive from Hughes was, let's buy some more casinos. And, and so he, uh, Mayhew goes out and says, OK, what's for sale? The Sands, OK, let's buy the Sands. Uh, you know, the, the Frontier, let's buy the Frontier. The Silver Slipper, let's buy that, Castaway. I mean, if you remember, uh, I have a real soft spot for the Silver Slipper and the Castaways from when I was a kid for weird reasons. But those were not exactly marquee hotels <laughs> in Las Vegas. They were kind of low rent places, really. Cool stuff happened there, don't get me wrong. But, you know, they were not you know, the best hotels in town. And so Hughes was just buying what was available. That's what I would Well, uh, thank you all very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to get some more chips. So I'm going to find more power to use. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else? Thank you.